12 minutes. Hi everyone um, and welcome to the second day of Repository Fringe um, and for getting here nice and early. Um, first of all, we've got Chris Orr from the University of Hull who's going to talk about hydro. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about Hydra, and uh, hopefully the meaning of that will come, come clear as we move through the presentation. Um, some of you will be familiar with Hydra. I've talked about it at previous repository fringes. Uh, but for those who are not familiar, I'll uh, go into a full description. I'd also like to just offer a thanks to uh, my colleague Tom Kramer at Stanford University for some of the slides. Uh, he puts together some very good slide decks. So well, three parts to this presentation. What is Hydra and why Hydra? Um, state of the hydrosphere, and then Hydra at Hull, our own institutional repository. I'll give you an update on where we're up with that. So Hydra, it started out in 2008 as a collaborative project between ourselves at the University of Hull, uh, the University of Virginia, Stanford University, and what was then Fedora Commons, but then of course has now become Duraspace, um, and then a technical consultancy called Media Shelf, which came on board very shortly afterwards. Um, we call it the Hydra Project. It's never actually been a funded project. We simply decided to do it because we felt there was a need to do it. And we had that common need. And essentially, it, that common need was recognizing that we all wanted to be able to have flexible ways of developing repository solutions for the different types of digital content that we had at each of our institutions. But we wanted to be able to do that in a flexible way, a reusable way, a sustainable way without having to keep generating different repository solutions for each individual use case. So the overall aim was to work towards a reusable framework for multi-purpose, multi-function, multi-institutional repository enabled solutions. And we initially set ourselves a three-year time frame to um, implement that. Uh, by the end of the three years, all of the original partners were up and running uh, with uh, the, the, uh, the software. Um, and we had generated enough interest at that point uh, within the community generally to extend the Hydra project now indefinitely um, and um, take it forward in whatever direction it was felt appropriate to take it in. We had two fundamental assumptions that underpinned everything we did. Uh, the first one was that no single system can provide the full range of repository-based solutions for any given institution's needs. It's nigh on impossible to squeeze everything into one box. At the same time, we do need sustainable solutions. Well, sustainable solutions do require a common infrastructure. We don't want to be having to maintain multiple boxes. The second fundamental assumption was that no single institution can resource the development of a full range of solutions on its own. So even if we, even if we wanted to generate, say, a common infrastructure or multiple infrastructures, very, very few, almost no institution, and we're talking here that this includes Stanford University with a uh, frightening number of resources compared with elsewhere. Uh, even their view is that they, no single institution can do everything by themselves. You need to work together in order to achieve the long-term goals. And yet, at the same time, each individual institution needs the flexibility to tailor their solutions to meet local demands and workflows. So challenges based on those assumptions we took forward. So what is Hydra? Hydra is a repository solution uh, that is now implemented at a, a, number of, a wide number of people, uh, institutions across the world. Um, I'll show you the list of them in a, in a moment. Um, and it's essentially something you can just take, you can implement, you can run a repository solution. It does require work. Hydra is built on the premise that you will have particular local needs, and Hydra is there to allow you to adapt the system to meet those local needs but it does provide that common infrastructure upon which you can uh, build those local modifications. The key to Hydra is that Hydra is a community. Uh, when we started the Hydra project, we recognized that if we didn't try and build the community, if we didn't try and uh, 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 get, uh, spread a, 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 the word of what we were trying to do, to sort of, what, sort of bounce ideas off people, then it was never going to work. It would be another nice open source project which would then sort of peter off at the end of the three years we gave ourselves. But by building a community, we've enabled us to give, we've given ourselves the chance to be sustainable into the future by encouraging lots of input from lots of different places. Hydra is also a technical framework. So I mentioned it's a solution that you can adapt. It's a technical framework which is a, you can also then just use to build whatever repository solution you would like to build, um, <clears throat> depending on what needs you have. 
And ultimately, Hydra is open source software, uh, like so many of the other repository softwares. You can download it, you can use it, it's free. Apache 2 licensed. Um, the software that we uh, do use within Hydra is uh, the Fedora repository, um, which is then linked into the so uh, Solar Index, a uh, very powerful indexing tool that's commonly used by a number of um, applications now. Uh, for our front end, we use Blacklight, which is designed as a next generation library catalog interface and is used quite extensively for that purpose in its own right, but we're here now adapting it for use with repositories as well. Uh, we're also using it for our catalog at the University of Hull. Um, and everything that we try and build, or everything we're building, is based on Ruby as a software platform, uh, largely because of the agility it gives us and the ability, uh, the ability to make uh, swift changes uh, and uh, develop solutions quickly, uh, but also because it has very excellent testing tools to make sure that all, everything we develop is stable. Why do we have to do Hydra if we've already got Fedora and we're building on Fedora? Well, Fedora itself can be quite complex in enabling its flexibility. It's a hugely powerful system, but it takes a lot of effort to get it off the ground to do what you would like to do with it. So what Hydra's endeavored to do is to try and, in a sense, hide, hide, hide Fedora and make it a hell of a lot easier to exploit that flexibility without having to get into the depths and the nitty gritty of doing so. And the concept of doing that is to produce what we call Hydra heads, Hydra single body, lots of heads. Hydra is, is you have one single body of content, you have multiple points of access onto that content, each one representing a different head. In terms of our community growth, uh, we started off in 2008 and we've been sort of reporting at open repositories conferences uh, since then. Um, interestingly enough, this slide was actually presented initially at OR12 by Tom Kramer, who boldly said, oh, by OR13, we'll have over 20 people and so forth, and 20 institutions involved. And actually, it's been more than that in the end. So um, his bold statement actually came to pass, uh, which is, I think, a, a nice reflection on the, the value that people have uh, found in the work that the project's undertaken. In terms of who has, it is US-centric. There's no doubt about it. There's a lot of interest amongst US institutions. Uh, you'll recognize many of the names that are up there in terms of the larger um, US institutions, but um, ourselves at the University of Hull, uh, we're by no means a large institution in terms of resources. Uh, we've very much benefited from being part of this community. All other, elsewhere in the Europe, we have the London School of Econ um, LSE, the London School of Economics, and the, in Europe, the Royal Library of Denmark. Uh, and it's also being used at Glasgow Caledonian and Oxford. So, we'll continue to grow, I hope. In terms of what Hydra is being used for, it can be used for books, um, articles, uh, research publications, e-prints, whatever you want to call them, uh, theses. Um, these are various different examples of what people have actually applied Hydra to do. Images, maps, data, different types of data, um, audio files, uh, and the ability to play them within the repository, uh, video, and other documents uh, of, that you may wish to manage. So a very wide variety of different types of content. And key to what Hydra does is, is try to get away from the idea of each of those having to be managed through a separate silo. So quite often, it's easy, well, let's set up an image repository, let's set up a geospatial repository, let's set up a records management system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you, just, well, you have to sort of manage all, of, all these different systems, which makes preservation difficult across them, that you're not connecting the content between them, um, how sustainable is that? And that's the question that Hydra seeks to address. So by virtue of creating that single body of content, but with multiple point heads, multiple workflows that you can adapt accordingly to meet the needs of different content, then we can develop scalable, robust, shared management and preservation services based on that single body of content. Hence Hydra, one body, many heads. Um, an underpinning, I suppose, is that there's four key capabilities, and that is that we can support any kind of record and any kind of metadata. Um, that comes from Fedora, essentially, but we're then exploiting it through Hydra. We can also do object-specific behaviors, so we can actually have different workflows, different user interfaces, different ways of working with different types of material. So it's almost like sometimes you are using different systems, but you are actually using the same system, just in different ways. And we can also tailor the views to meet different domain needs, different uh, subject discipline needs, depending on what's required. 
And then key to it, as I mentioned earlier, is that you can override things with local modifications uh, because we recognize that people need to have, uh, have local needs. So just to take two screenshots from our own repository, um, as it currently stands, uh, to show a very brief version of the adaptability, is on the left-hand side we have a journal article which is displayed as much as you might expect a journal article. It's got the uh, title, authors, licensing, abstract. And then a sort of we've separated out the publication metadata at the bottom so it's clear where the publication uh, sits. On the right-hand side, in the same place, we have a data, a data set uh, which we've adapted because it has multiple files for download, uh, but also because we wanted to embed some uh, Google Maps uh, uh, ge geospatial coordinates to represent the scope of the data set within the repository. Um, in terms of Hydra at Hull, uh, we've been able to exploit this capability uh, to, for a wide variety of different types of content. Um, we are conscious that uh, when it comes to managing a repository, we, are, we need to be careful about overstretching ourselves, over, uh, so in a sense, going, uh, managing too much. But at the same time, it's nice to be able to say yes to people uh, and uh, adapt Hydra accordingly. In terms of our Hydra at Hull um, uh, development, uh, we are in the process of upgrading it to the latest version of the Hydra software, uh, which has reached version 6. And we're also now implementing a bootstrap design. Uh, if you're not, if bootstrap is the user interface library that has been, was a, uh, built for Twitter and is now being used. Uh, it's open source and can be used by anyone wishing to do, uh, design uh, innovative web uh, interfaces. Um, we're not quite sure about the brown yet, but uh, it was a first, first pass. Um, but the whole idea is to try and make it uh, attractive, um, somewhere that people would like to be able to come, and also sticks in people's minds so that they know where they can get hold of particular types of content. Finally then, seven strategic Hydra priorities. Uh, we um, set out a strategic plan earlier this year to take Hydra forward. Uh, we want to be able to develop solution bundles. Uh, so Hydra has been applied in many different use cases. We want to be able to wrap up some of those use cases into bundles that people can simply download and implement if they have a particular content management need. Um, but we also want, well, the idea, we also want to develop turnkey applications, which makes it really easy. So um, the thing about downloading Fedora and downloading Hydra to a certain extent is that there's a certain amount of technical effort to get things up and running. Um, the whole idea is we want to be able to make them more turnkey. You download it, you plug it in, it works. We want to grow the Hydra vendor ecosystem. We recognize that, as open, many open source communities have, is there is benefit in having vendors providing support for the open source software. And we already have that with a couple of vendors already, but we want to try and expand that vendor ecosystem. Uh, so there is greater support out there in the community. Uh, we're also codifying a scalable training framework. We have regular Hydra camps. Uh, week-long events where people can immerse themselves in what uh, implementing Hydra is all about. Uh, there was one at um, Trinity College Dublin uh, back in April. Uh, there's another one at Virginia next week. Um, and through that, we're establishing, in a sense, a curriculum about what it means to actually implement Hydra. We're developing a documentation framework alongside that. We're very keen to ensure that the technical framework allows code sharing. We have a week uh, exercise in September where we'll be in a set, well, they're called gemifying everything in the Hydra to make sure that you can take individual bits of it and use them in a reusable way. And we're going to continue to refresh and intensify the community ties. Uh, and in December this year, we're planning a big event where all partners will be attending in order to um, encourage um, communication and uh, interaction between them. So I'll stop there, probably a bit too long. Uh, but say thank you very much. And uh, if you want to see our, our repository at Hull is at that top address. Further information on the project itself at the bottom address. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, has anybody got any questions for Chris? Oh. Bootstrap was a library that was designed either for Twitter or by Twitter, I don't know, and then released as an open source package of uh, essentially CSS libraries. Okay. Um, and you can download it and then you can, impl you can um, plug it into, you can either design your entire website using the, the, the Bootstrap design, which is what we are doing uh, with um, uh, our repository and have already done with our library catalog. 
uh, or you can actually just take elements of it and plug it into whatever website you want to use it for. Is it, is it mainly for responsiveness and kind of mobile and tablet apps? And do you think that's where... Well, it's, it's, that's one very important aspect, yes. I mean, everything that we design using Bootstrap is then um, um, usable on mobile devices. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a nice design. I mean, it's also in trying to make it attractive so people feel that it's a website worth coming to. Cool. So, Your OAI PMS endpoints, does that have it? Oh, right, yes. Oh, wait. oh, oh do you, oh, you, mean, you mean raw map doesn't have it also? The raw, yeah. Yes. Oh, well, we have it, yes. So I'll get, certainly. Yeah. Um, anybody else? A lot of the open source repository platforms always have a constant challenge of sort of recruiting new developers and, and keeping them moving. Mm -hmm. Hydra doesn't seem to have that issue, it seems to be sort of a roaring success. Can you sort of sum up in 30 seconds what you think, you know, is behind that? Um, I'd, I'll use an analogy, which is that um, when we came to decide, determining how we were going to develop Hydra, um, a decision was taken to use Ruby. Now, there were two reasons for that. One, it, probably because existing tools that we knew we liked were Ruby-based, and therefore it made sense to try and build around those. Our developer, and indeed all the developers at Stanford, none of them had ever used Ruby. And so it was a real sort of, let's launch ourselves into this and see what happens. Um, it, I mean, uh, our, our single developer sort of get his, got his head around it within about six weeks, and now will not use anything else. Uh, and he just really enjoys that environment. And that seems to be a pattern that's sort of replicated across the different people who are making contributions, is that they just enjoy working within that environment, um, and they enjoy the interaction of people bouncing ideas off each other. I have to say, one thing I would say, though, is that one of the reasons it's potentially successful in the US, because it's coming out of the US, is because, and this is a sort of slight bugbear of my own, is that the US libraries take technical development very seriously. And they put the resource in place to do it. And therefore, they have the wherewithal to have that type of interaction. Um, that sometimes seems to be a struggle in the UK, but something, if we're going to take the development of repositories seriously, something we have to give attention to. Sorry, I've got a question. Um, so in having developed Hydra, does that mean that you're more likely to develop other things in-house because you have the Ruby skills, and has it influenced other things you've taken on? Uh, I suppose we can certainly adapt those Ruby skills, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, to take two examples, we've done, um, uh, we're doing a lot of our um, ref output uh, capture uh, using Ruby now mm -hmm. uh, because it's easier just to extract things from the de relevant database using that approach. And in terms of data management, we're using Blacklight uh, in order to be able to help surface data sets to enable people to search through and analyze data sets as well. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, and next up we have Andrew and Pablo from Medina and the RepNet project. consultant in our project for the last two years on uh, UK repository net which is uh, a project to to build out a social technical infrastructure to support the network of uh, institutional repositories in the UK it was a two-year project it was funded by JISC it came to an end two days ago so this is an appropriate time to be telling you about some of the lessons we learned from the project and some of the outputs and outcomes from the project it it was a very interesting project because the focus was very firmly on research articles and as we will see during the uh, presentation and to a larger extent in our round table which is going to follow on after coffee, uh, it also proved in some ways a slightly limiting factor in that we found out an awful lot more around the landscape of CRISs and IRs, research information management, research data management, and research articles within, within repositories, which we'd like to explore in more detail uh, during the uh, roundtable session. 
So RepNet in a nutshell, basically what we were doing was we were taking various different projects that had been in, some of them running for a long time, like Romeo and Juliet. Some of them had been proto-services like the Pyrus initiative through Mimus, uh, some of which, which were completely new things that actually came out during our fact-finding, during the project as being things that were required that we then started to bring to the stage where they were ready to be run into services. Uh, we'll be going through some of the outcomes in the course of our presentation and some of the project findings and the lessons learned. But what, I'd like, what we'd like to do, first of all, is talk about the landscape. Pablo. Yep. Um, hello, everyone. Um, this is one of the most uh, general landscapes uh, the RevNet has delivered. We saw some of the other ones yesterday at the STARS presentation. This is a very generic landscape of the open access uh, domain showing the different areas in it from open access policies covered by Sherpa Juliet, Sherpa Romeo, through the open access platforms including the uh, journals, the OJS systems we have been discussing here, and the repository network uh, with uh, stakeholders such as DOAJ or Opendoor behind them. Uh, then we have the initiatives for enhancing the IR network, such as the RevNet itself, or open air at European level. And then finally, the, this other final strand, uh, repository sustainability and governance, uh, behind which we can find the Confederation of Open Access Repositories core. This last one is probably the, the weakest one uh, these days. This is something we will have the chance to explore later on. So this is our website. and. That really explains in a nutshell what it is that we do. So you can see these are the different services that are now ready to go. And the good news from our project is we've made a business case uh, for this to be continued. We've got, or the project has got two more years funding from JISC. So the really good news is that Iris, Romeo, Juliet, Repository Junction Broker, and some of the other new initiatives will be continued over the next two years under the leadership of JISC. We also looked, as well as the services, which we headline, we've got the relevant function areas of aggregation, benchmarking, depositing, metadata enhancement, registries of repositories, um, discovery, and um, continuity of access through, through, through disaster recovery. We'll be briefly uh, talking about each of these as we go through uh, our presentation today. Some of the rep RepNet outcomes. Now, I'm, I'm putting this up really as a as a taster for the round table because we don't have time to go through this in any detail. But uh, what one of the important outcomes was uh, we used an ITIL framework for managing the, the challenges in the project, which essentially is multiple players uh, in terms of uh, repository, repository platforms, uh, funders, IR managers, uh, and um, uh, research information managers, and also our different component providers, because we were working with Manchester, with Nottingham, with Edinburgh University. So we needed a framework to describe what it was that we were doing. We found ITIL was, was a very good way of, 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 of doing that. The other ones we'll be talking about in a bit more detail after, after the coffee break. So what, this is kind of what lies underneath Rep, RepNet, and I've used this slide, slide a few times, but basically the takeaway from this is that these are the main areas that uh, we wanted to address. That came out of our, our fact-finding, our, our research on uh, user requirements. And basically, we're covering aggregation, benchmarking, and reporting through the, through the IRIS tool, the reg a, a registry of repositories, both open door and ROAR as existing registries, and a call-out OARR, which uh, has gone out. The grant letter is about to be issued for a new registry of repositories. Uh, the deposit tools, Romeo, Juliet, the RJ broker, and then <coughs> tools for enhancing metadata quality. We, did a, we found an, an awful lot about that when we were doing our, our outreach and, and our dissemination. And then a gap analysis of where some of the gaps in metadata could potentially be filled through new services or through new initiatives. So that is kind of what underlies the, the nice... Um, uh, website that I showed you. Talking very briefly about ITIL, how many people here are familiar with ITIL as a framework? Okay, good, good. That's, that's encouraging. We found it very useful because the basic language of uh, service strategy, 
service design, service transition, and then eventually service operation, uh, pro it proved to, to, for us to be very, very useful in des describing to our component providers exactly where we thought they were at and where, where we were at at the process of taking a, multi a multitude of different projects and proto-services and turn getting them to the stage where they're ready to, to go into service operation. So the RepNet website, as I say, these are, these, these are the relevant function areas that, uh, that we were looking at. And one of our other outcomes was, as I say, the focus originally on research articles within uh, institutional repositories. We found quite quickly that the landscape was constantly developing. Remember, we started two years ago, and the landscape, I think, looked very different then. So one of the things that we did as an out, outcome, or an output, was to create uh, the, the Chris IR landscape. Yeah, two details with regard to this landscape we also saw yesterday is that there is indeed a long tail of uh, standalone, repositor standalone repositories in the network that should also be cared for in terms of uh, repository service provision. Uh, even despite the fact that there is a growing number of uh, CRIS systems running, especially in research intensive universities. We would like to uh, explore later uh, at the round table what's the rate of implementation for CRIS systems and to what extent they might replace some of the repository uh, provided functionalities. Um, that, that, that will be later on though. Another important outcome of the RepNet project was uh, the stakeholder engagement activity. This is a, uh, an, an, an overview of, of it. You can see it's quite uh, wide and, and complex. Lots of stakeholders uh, around the RepNet. On the institutional side, uh, we have the HEIs, the uh, universities, with uh, the service providers for, for maintaining or even hosting their, their systems, repositories, creases and the vendors involved in the enhancement of these. We have the JISC as, as our, our funder and, and uh, uh, provider of, of instructions. We have the, the funders, RCUK, welcome with, they have very much driven the uh, open access area in, uh, recently, uh, especially after Finch report. Um, we have the component providers as key elements in the RevNet projects, that is uh, the University of Nottingham CRC, uh, MIMES and uh, the EDINA as such. Uh, the international area, uh, it's the most generic one, uh, is uh, represented by OpenAir, which is a very parallel project to the RepNet one, only at European level. There, there, are, there were quite a number of overlapping areas between both, and the discussions were very, very fruitful. We have CORE, the Confederation of Open Access Repositories, and Eurocris at, at the other end of the institutional side, uh, working on, on the CRIS uh, environment. And finally, we have associations such as uh, UK Core, the uh, Council of uh, Research Repositories in the UK, uh, RSP and ARMA as uh, also very relevant stakeholders we engaged with during the project. The STARS uh, uh, Shared Initiative was one of the main outcome of the RevNet as well uh, in uh, stakeholder engagement and also in uh, exploring how the landscape analysis we had done could be applied to a specific institution, namely the University of St. Andrews, with uh, its specific system configuration uh, and, a, and a repository and a CRIS system working along each other, with the CRIS acting as master system in terms of uh, research information management. Um, as you see, we were exploring uh, the ways of uh, delivering repository services on, on top of that system with a double uh, option uh, usually available for delivering the services either on the repository side or on the CRIS side or both, uh, which was one of the main uh, uh, tasks of, of, of this shared initiative actually to find out what was more convenient for the institution. Finally, these are, this is a summary of uh, the lessons learned, the findings of, of uh, the RevNet project. Again, it's, it's too large, this, for, for going through it in detail right now. This will more or less act as uh, an agenda for the roundtable we will be having after the coffee. Um, ETIL is in there, uh, the repository network evolution is in there. We're hoping to collect your feedback.
feedback and your input into the discussion in order to explore the different items on, on this list. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew and Pavlu. As they said, they've got a round table afterwards to go into things in more detail. So have you got a question? Um, firstly, can I just say, um, I think Iris has been one of those real success stories. I mean, it's been out of all the projects funded, not just with, with this and other things over the years, I think it's been a really, really useful service. Um, I think there's lots and lots of potential in the future about different directions you can go in, providing different kinds of stats and analysing them. But two things on there which, which I'm sort of curious about but I haven't seen so much about. One is the repository junction about working with publishers and allowing them to sort of pull data in different ways to, to sort of share metadata. And the second one was the sort of metadata enhancement. Um, and I think in my head when I think about that, I think about, for example, the, the, the REF system, the research um, framework excellent framework system, um, where when you've been uploading data into there, it reports back on, it uses Crossref to come back with uh, matching metadata, showing invalid DOIs, those sort of things have been really useful in actually tidying up our data. Um, and I was wondering what you're doing in that kind of area. Okay, so there's, there's three things there. There's IRIS, which I want to say a little bit about more about. There's the RJ broker, and then there's metadata, met metadata enhancement. So. I'll, I'll talk about Iris, then I'll hand over to Pablo for the broker and the metadata enhancement. So I think um, people who are in the session on repositories of the future yesterday, Balvear mentioned that um, at the moment with Iris, we've got uh, 35 institutions signed up for, for Iris, which is great. We Ultimately, we'd like to get to something like 150. As came out in the session yesterday with, with St Andrews, we found that when Claire installed Iris on the SDLC network, to get, start getting IRIS results for University of St Andrews, I think it took 15, 20 minutes, or it was a bit longer, a bit, a bit longer but it was basically, it was, it was a very simple, simple, sim, simple uh, thing to install. Uh, initial results from that, that, these 35 institutions actually are quite astonishing. I mean, Balver mentioned 3 million uploads uh, over the course of a month. Da sorry, da sorry, downloads. <laughs> which would be, would be quite extraordinary, because if we extrapolate that right the way across the UK, I think what we're going to find is that the level of traffic across the institutional network is much larger than anybody could possibly have thought. So I would agree with you, I'm, we're very, very excited about IRIS as, as an output, but I think there's an awful lot more to come from IRIS. And if you extend IRIS, at the moment it's counter-compliant download statistics, but if, if you extend that out to do some of the other things that you can do around that platform with, uh, bibli with bibliometrics and altmetrics, then I think that it becomes even, even more interesting. So I think there's an awful lot more to come out of the IRIS project, but uh, we've also got the broker, so Pablo will say a bit more. So about that. regarding the broker, we see, it as, uh, we see it as a potential game changer in terms of content collection uh, tools for repositories, especially after the Hefke consult, uh, consultation takes place. Uh, there could be a mandate and the need to collect uh, contents into the repositories, full text contents. So uh, the broker will offer a sort mediated uh, procedure for uh, delivering this content into the repository network, potentially into Chris systems as well, depending on what the vendors are up to in, in this regard. Uh, we went very briefly through uh, the mechanisms for content delivery yesterday. We will again uh, explore those uh, in, in the round table. Uh, this is relevant uh, because this complexity we saw in, uh, in, the, in the landscape for system configuration impacts quite deeply on the requirements and the uh, specifications for implementing the broker for every specific platform. So every institution is running a kind of a, a case specific system configuration and y we need to uh, take care of every single uh, repository platform and version in order to work uh, on, on a push uh, mechanism through uh, swords into repositories. We, we, will, we will have the chance to, to look at that later on. So it's, it's like two pieces of it. The, uh, the core of the service is finished. The uh, implementation of it needs to deal with specific institutions and it's, it's being implemented uh, as we speak. So. Uh, oh. 
Um, so just to add to what Pablo was saying was that RJB at the moment is um, uh, uh, being in, in test phase. So they're testing it with um, uh, Nature Publishing, the data from Nature Publishing Group and Europe PMC, and it's being tested with, tested with Imperial and Oxford. So the data is being pushed um, via the repository junction broker to those institutions, but that's all in test phase at the moment. Um, and there's, yeah, there's, it, it, in terms of what the broker can do, it can do uh, one to many deposits. So that's a potential of it. So it can say, this is, um, this is co-authored. Can we put this, um, th this paper goes into X repository and Y repository at the same time with the metadata, with the content, and that's being tested. Um, and yeah, both both those publishers are really on on board. I would like to highlight this art article that was published by uh, William Nixon, Valerie McCutcheon, and Susan Ashworth from the University of Glasgow Library uh, on research and APC funding workflows at the University of Glasgow. This uh, relates very much to what you mentioned about the REF. Uh, it, this is about collecting funder and uh, grant awards, project information as part of the metadata for specific items in the repository. And this was published two, three days ago uh, in the UKSG Insights Journal. Uh, so again, we will be talking about this later on. There are quite a number of uh, potential uh, metadata enhancements to be delivered into repositories, um, and, and it should very much improve the quality of metadata. Thank you very much to um, Pablo and Andrew. I think we need to move on, but they've got the round table next if you've got any more questions for them. Um, Next, we have Angus White from the Digital Curation Centre. First, I'd like to thank Sarah Jones for some input to this, uh, her presentation as well. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, share some uh, experiences from Digital Creation Centre's programme of institutional engagement and talk a bit about uh, the roles of repository managers in relation to other parts of the ins institution. Uh, in, a, in a sense, this follows on from the previous presentations because it's, it's about inter interoperability but starting from the question of who the repository needs to interact with rather than, than, than what. Um, I'll give some background on, on our program uh, and outline our, our, our view of the uh, research data management services and uh, draw on some uh, surveys that have been published recently on that, on that as, as well. Um, so for those of you who are not already aware, we've been around for uh, almost 10 years and the first half of that really is, was focused on digital preservation and in the latter half we've had much more of a focus on, on research data management. Um, we've been, f uh, we had uh, additional funding from FK from 2011 to help institutions to build capacity in, in research data management. Um, and over the last uh, 18 months or so, we've uh, engaged with 21 universities uh, with a, a mi mixture of uh, Russell Group institutions uh, some newer universities and mostly uh, uh, pre-1992 institutions. So I'll talk about the, uh, the extremes of the, as it were, between uh, institutions who are uh, research intensive and, and those that, that aren't. Um, 
We've also uh, had a, more of a background role in uh, the Just Managing Research Data program, uh, where, which has funded 25 projects uh, since 2009 uh, to develop infrastructure in specific institutions. Uh, and our, our role there has been to uh, provide tools to uh, su support them and also support for events and to help draw out uh, the lessons uh, and good examples to amplify across the sector. Uh, so uh, one of the things we brought out recently has been a, a how-to guide on developing uh, research data management services. So we have a, a, a view of the development process, which I won't go into in, in, in much detail, because I, I don't know if this is something that you're all familiar with, but starting with uh, the need for senior management to decide what it is that they want to do and to emphasize and, and respond to the, the uh, uh, funder uh, policies. In, in, this, in this area, and ending up with a, some process of at least self-evaluation of, of how, how well uh, institutions uh, met the needs expressed. And of course, we all know that this isn't a linear process. It's uh, uh, very much a process of uh, uh, ever increasing circles. Uh, our, our role has, has been f focused on the er earlier stages in, in helping institutions to develop policy and, and uh, helping them senior management to ad advocate that policy across uh, research groups and, and other service providers in the uh, institu institution. Um, so we have... Um, uh, several tools that have built on on work uh, carried out else, elsewhere. Cardio as uh, stands for collaborative as assessment of research data infrastructure and objectives, and draws on work at uh, Cornell and and also at uh, ULCC. Uh, DAF, I, I guess you'll all already have, have heard about, uh, and also draws on on work that was uh, carried out by the data library and, and uh, uh, data librarians and in other institutions in 2006. Um, and through uh, working with uh, the institutions that we work with and also by um, uh, speaking with with just in particular Simon Hodson, the program manager for managing research data, we came up with this view of uh, of the services that we see emerging um, over the last few years. Uh, it's a very high level view, uh, but obviously with uh, an idea of services supporting the research cycle from from the earliest stages of data management planning and through to uh, establishing a data catalog uh, with at least metadata on uh, data assets. Uh, and probably you can probably uh, see repository rows f falling on, th on the bottom uh, and left side of, 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 of that. Um, so, uh, in parallel with that, there's been uh, a number of uh, really good sur surveys published in the last year. One of them uh, focusing on, on, on the states by Carl Tenneper and uh, Ben Birch and Susie Allard. Uh, an another uh, by Andrew Cox and Stephen Pinfield at Sheffield, uh, which was uh, published very recently. Uh, drawing on a survey of, of 81 UK institutions 
and a similar survey which uh, was carried out by, by Sheila Coro and others with a similar number of institutions responding, which has only just uh, come out. Uh, oh, that's the wrong citation. It's in Library Trends, so I'll fix that. But um, very interesting surveys uh, because they looked at uh, what uh, the uh, what libraries in particular are planning to deliver in, in the next few years. And uh, the <coughs> survey by uh, Cox and Pinfield uh, asked people to prioritise these. The uh, survey by Sheila Coral and, and, and Co looked at what people currently have in place and what, what they're planning to uh, deliver in the next few years. And side, side by side, I uh, see pretty much uh, that... Uh, there's similar order. Uh, there wasn't, I think, a great deal of difference between the ranking of priorities, so I'm not sure how much weight to put on them. But I think there's some interesting points here. One, one that we've still got a lot of work to do to support institutions to develop policy. Uh, and also, interestingly, that uh, DMP advice comes quite surprisingly low down that list, considering it's one of the the things that funders emphasise. And I suspect that's probably because libraries see that as something that uh, research offices have to support uh, pre-award teams in, in particular. Uh, and I think it begs questions about, about uh, how, how much of these roles, especially the uh, advisory and liaison roles on repositories and how much on, on other parts of the ins institution. Uh, so um, what, what we've found uh, when, we, when we go out to work with institu institutions is re re really the repository managers are uh, getting involved in a lot of these areas. Uh, just comparing uh, two institutions, Oxford Brooks uh, and University of Edinburgh, uh, two very different institutions, uh, one with hundreds of research staff, the other with, with thousands. But similar things uh, that we've, we've, we've found, the repository managers taking uh, quite a lead role in uh, the steering groups that uh, institutions put together uh, to, to, to de develop policy responses and online guidance and all the rest of the things that are uh, uh, highlighted in, in, in the surveys. Um, so we've uh, also seen them getting actively involved in uh, uh, going out to speak to research groups and interviewing them about their current practices and also uh, developing skills of uh, subject librarians. So uh, Oxford Books, for, for example, has been very much driven by uh, the EPSRC expectations as a lot of institutions have uh, and have uh, although they're aware that the infrastructure isn't what they would like it to be, they're, they're very focused on what they want to do and um, have done quite a lot in the last few years. They have uh, data in their inst institutional repository and they're establishing a help desk, uh, all, all without any dedicated research data management staff. So carved out of existing roles. Uh, there's a contrast there with Edinburgh, of course. Uh, uh, a lot of people will know that Edinburgh's been active in this area uh, uh, for, for many years. I uh, don't know if Robin Rice is in the audience. I don't think she is, but uh, she's 
had a, a very active role in, in the uh, STEAM group here. And I heard her saying yesterday that uh, since the, the, we began work on the data access framework and the data library uh, many years ago, they, they've had active involvement with uh, social science li librarians uh, to help build that. Um, and Edinburgh has been a pioneer of uh, research data policy, much copied, and also of uh, training materials, especially with the uh, mantra course. Uh, so, to so, so in our experience, repository managers are very active in kickstarting the softer. Uh, parts of the services that are being developed. Uh, we are really finding that very few universities uh, yet have any dedicated uh, research data management staff. It uh, uh, tends to be uh, carved out of existing academic liaison roles, uh, and this is also uh, being picked up by the uh, service that I mentioned. Um, and I, I think it's kind of obvious that uh, repositories already deal with uh, computing services and, and research support and uh, records managers. But <coughs> what, um, uh, what I hope uh, we can discuss later in, in, in the other uh, round table that we have next door is what uh, <coughs> what research data in, in, entails for these these relationships in terms of the day-to-day -day work uh, I, I, I think in a, in a lot of cases uh, th these are things that are decided uh, ac across the board you uh, decide what licensing uh, policies apply and that, that's much less the case with uh, research data. And there, there are a lot of uh, uh, thorny issues, I think, to a large extent, the devil's in the, in, the, in the detail with research data, and these questions s still haven't been resolved. So these aren't issues that we have uh, ready answers to, and we're very keen to uh, hear what you, what you think about them. Uh, so that's or really I have to say for now, so thanks, thanks very much. And um, if you have any questions uh, just, just now, happy to take them, but we have a round table as well after the break. Thank you very much to Angus. And has anybody got any immediate questions? I've got one immediate question, partly because I can't come to your um, round table uh, after the coffee. I uh, talk about data catalogues. Is that like a repository of different, uh, sorry, a registry of different uh, data repositories? And if so, is there, is there any notion of having a kind of a common, common way of benchmarking metadata in a way that is meaningful for different disciplines like genetics and physics, where I would imagine you've got very, very different types of data sets and therefore very different ways of describing them? Uh, it's a good question. I think the, the first part of your answer, uh, we see data catalogues more as uh, catalogues of, of what the institution, uh, what research data has been produced in the institution and, and which it sees as, a, as an asset because not everything is going to be recorded. But uh, uh, and not everything will be will, 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 will be deposited in, in the institutional data repository if there is one, because not all institutions will be able to build a, an, an institutional data repository. Some will outsource it. But generally, uh, we we think institutions will want a record of of what's been deposited el else, elsewhere, even if they don't keep it themselves. Uh, so, uh, 
it does need uh, uh, lowest common denominator or highest common factor, however you want to look at it, of uh, the core metadata and um, a strategy for, for dealing with the disciplinary metadata. Uh, and I think uh, we'll look to Southampton colleagues, particularly because they've, they've thought this through very uh, very well, I think, in having a three-level ap ap approach. So you encourage people to ad adopt uh, the best uh, standards for, for, for the discipline, but you don't shoehorn people into a very complex common one. You have the bare minimum uh, in for, the, for, the, for, for, for the data catalogue, which is usually... Um, uh, at, at, at least the, uh, the data site um, minimum uh, and you also have a uh, uh, st strategy f for dealing with project level me metadata Just a question about the survey and whether you thought it was, um, whether you were shocked by the results. And you, you mentioned at the end the whole idea that there's still very few libraries that have dedicated RDM staff. And yeah. whether you think that the community will listen to the results of the survey and the fact that it said that the priorities were policy, training, and advice. Yeah. Uh, or do you think the, the do you think people will actually go and hire people for those jobs, or they will just hire institutional data management people? I think what we're hearing is that uh, people are trying to carve those roles out of existing roles, uh, and hiring uh, research data management people as project managers to, to, to develop things for a short, well, relatively short period, maybe one or two years. Uh, whether that will change as institutions see their need to meet the, the EPSRC de 2015 deadline and the, the 2014 REF begins to become less of a priority, I think there might be a, a rush to hire more research data management staff next, in a year's time maybe. But uh, and what we're trying to emphasize is that institutions have to uh, figure this into their planning because if they, if they don't have it, uh, in, the, in, in the planning this year, then they might not be able to uh, get things going. You could probably fit them in a couple of taxis, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, permanent research data management staff. There's some projects that from the, from, particularly from, from the GSKMRD program, that have successfully got uh, their institutions to fund the roles because they see it as an area of competitive advantage. And I think more institutions will start to see that. Just uh, an observation, uh, really, Angus, and perhaps following up on that point, I think. I should know this for certain, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but both of those surveys that you talked about uh, involved asking libraries about yeah. their thoughts and plans for research data management, yeah. and it is worth bearing in mind that the library is not the university. And yeah. Although they're important stakeholders uh, in building successful research data services, they're not the only ones, and our own experience is, is that although in a number of universities they're taking the lead, I'd say there's a number of others uh, where they're, they're stepping back and following others. So if one wants to understand what are universities doing about research data, it's important that you don't just ask librarians. Well, yeah, definitely, yeah. I think that's reflected in the priorities that we saw. Slightly more of an observation than a question, but you had on the, one of the slides a question about uh, the trust in external repositories. Yeah. And I'd sort of ask, 
whose trust are we measuring there? Are we measuring the producers, the funders, the institutions, the authors, in term, for example, for the sustainability of the repository? Or are we looking at the trust of the consumers in, in the provenance of the data that they're getting from the repository? I think it's all those things, but at first it, I mean, it has to be a trust of the, of, the, of the researchers first, because they're the ones who actively seek to deposit something or, or not, uh, but also uh, of, the, of the institution, because well, part of the, uh, of the EPS, EPS SRC's expectations is, is that institutions won't ask researchers to deposit their data in jurisdictions where uh, uh, there's not the same level of uh, protection for data. So uh, that, I think, whether they'll actually police that or not is uh, another question. But I, th I think that there are, there's a, a, a gap at, at the moment in uh, guidance and accepted practice about uh, what what is a good uh, place to ask researchers to deposit their data, their, their the trust, trust standards uh, like data seal of approval and, and the ISO uh, 16363, yeah, <laughs> uh, which uh, have recently been established, but there's not many repositories actually accredited, so how do you actually decide, apart from looking at things like uh, data, pib, data bib, sorry, that uh, lists hundreds of repositories, but doesn't uh, offer any kind of guarantee that they're going to be around in five years' time or, 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 uh, or are properly managed. Uh, so it's, I think, what, what we probably need is something like RJ Broker for data, but there's probably a, a lot of work to be done before we get there, I, I think. Um, thank you very much um, for everybody who presented this morning. And now we've got coffee back in the foyer, and then we've got the round tables and developer challenge judging afterwards in the three rooms. Yeah, Chris? So here is. Repository net. Next door is Angus and the DCC, and then the judging is in room three if anybody wants to watch the presentations.